Hi, my name is Leanne Atkin. I'm a vascular nurse specialist at Mid York's NHS Trust and lecturer practitioner at University of Huddersfield. Thank you for joining us today on the part two of this webinar. Last week's webinar um, is the first one that Wounds UK has done. This has been done in partnership with LNR. Both of these sessions aim to embed best practice for the holistic management of venous leg ulceration, trying to dispel, dispel the myth that's out there. Last week's session concentrated on wound bed assessment. This session today is going to really focus on the management of the venous leg ulcer in terms of compression therapy. So just to recap from what we said last week, we, we considered the current situation. We explained that the management of leg ulceration has got a long way to come. We pointed out that only 16% of patients out there get an ABPI assessment and that our rates to healing are quite upsetting in many cases. We identified that there was a need for real change, real world guidance to help change what we are doing in clinical practice and we reflected on how the best practice statement can help to embed this within each and every one of your um, clinical services. So now it's time to consider compression. Leg ulceration management needs to be underpinned by evidence but actually quite often it's underpinned by ritualistic practice. One of the great things with the best practice statement, to me, is the myth busting. It tells you when to believe the evidence and when really to challenge the dogmas and tradition that's often embedded within local services. We need to do this to be able to reform the MHS, to be able to look at how we're managing patients with venous legals to help to improve their quality of lives. I'd like to share with you now a video that was recorded at last year's Wounds UK. This is by Alison Hopkins, a, a colleague of, of mine down in Accelerate CIC London. She's going to talk to you about some of the common myths and challenge them um, to help to improve your clinical practice. Well, thankfully, I haven't seen this very much, but it was common enough um, to bring into the myth section that superabsorbent dressings should not be used under the compression bandaging, but should be over, used over compression if required. Is this something that people see? Well, I think it's rather odd, <laughs> I have to say, uh, because, you know, why would you want, if that was on your leg, you would want the exudate tracking all the way through those layers to the uh, dressing on the outside. I think this comes down to the fact that people think that um, we need to be really, really vigilant about the ankle width, which is fine, but let's not pretend that we know the amount of compression that the limb is getting from your technique. We don't, even with the sub-bandage guides on various bandages. So, you know, let's just accept that actually there's a lot of variation there, and it's about the um, key theme about understanding the theory behind compression, which is the wider the limb, the less the compression gives to that limb. So we can do that, and you need to be um, skilled enough to vary your bandaging accordingly, but let's not put loads of super absorbents on top of the bandages. No idea where that came from. Um, people do use way too much wadding, I have to say. That's my personal opinion. Um, and uh, in, the, in Europe, you hardly see it used at all. So, you know, there's some critique there to be had. So uh, this is my favorite. So I'm going to spend a little time on this one. Um, reduced compression is therapeutic for venous leg ulcers. I have a particular issue, as I think the whole of the panel did, with the increasing use of light compression and reduced compression, whatever you want to call it. So whilst there is the, that old saying, you know, some compression is better than none, let's again not pretend that we're putting compression on that's therapeutic if we're using light compression. We're tickling the leg, okay? And it might look lovely, and it might stay up, and it might be comfortable for the patient, but it's not therapeutic, and we have to challenge this. So when we look at the sign guidelines, we say that high compression is around 23 to 35. It doesn't even mention the magical 40, by the way. Um, but there is a disagreement, actually, um, if you critique the literature and other consensus documents around what high compression is. And if light compression or reduced compression is under 20 millimeters of mercury pressure, you can see that in international consensus, they describe this as mild. Do you want to be putting mild compression on the limb? 
Andrew Nelson calls it homeopathic, <laughs> which I thought was fantastic, so I always have to attribute it to her because it is a great quote. But strong compression here is 40 to 60. That's 40 to 60, not 40, it's 40 to 60. So um, there's some disagreement here, but what we are in agreement about is that light compression is reduced therapy. You're not um, creating a therapeutic environment. So here's a, just a little um, uh, slide here about a particular bandage regime that has a standard um, a product and a reduced, so high compression and a reduced product. And you can see that over the years, the spend, that's what bandages have been bought in the NHS over the years, is reducing the high compression product and increasing use of reduced compression. Have we got more patients needing reduced compression? I don't think so, not necessarily, but it's because we think some is better than none. But the impact? The impact is on wet legs, unresolved problems, daily dressings, morale in district nursing shot, and we wonder why we're not having the impact on leg ulcer healing that, that we think we should have after over 20 years in this uh, game. Inelastic bandage is not suitable for immobile patients. Again, um, this started because about the impact of inelastic systems on the calf muscle, fantastic impact. But let's not take it to um, the, the length that it goes to, which is equals not for immobile patients. It's not true. They're very effective. And, um, and here we have um, a Pika press monitor um, demonstrating that someone who's immobile, they just need to do ankle flexions, toe curls, sitting up in bed. The other one is standing. Just standing increases the sub-bandage pressure. It's therapeutic. It provides a massaging effect. Hosiery kits are only for self-caring patients. Um, again, what we've done in this document is say we can use this as first line. First line for those um, who've got a pretibial laceration, hematoma and so on, get some support on the leg. It will stop infection and stop them going through cellulitic emissions for hematoma. You've just got to get the hosiery on, on quickly and uh, there's very good evidence for them being very therapeutic for ulcers around the gator region and we've spelt that out within the document. And my final one, whoops, sorry, is about compression to the foot. Now, this is a strange one. Actually, I have no idea where this started, but I hear it from patients and nurses all the time that, oh, no, you don't apply compression to the foot. You apply compression from the turn that comes out of the ankle. This is not right. You apply higher compression from the, term of the turn out of the ankle, but you need to compress the foot. Whilst we are not addressing the foot, you see this impact. You see squeezing of the edema down to the toes, creating lymphedematous toes, creating more problems and more erosions. We've got to stop this. We've got to compress the foot and allow the, the bandage to work on the foot pump as well as the calf pump. We're creating real damage to the toes by um, uh, the in, um, elastic effect of compression at the ankle if you don't address the foot. So I'm sure, I'm sure many of you will be able to um, really relate to some of those myths that Alison spoke about. I do, especially the one about no compression on your foot. And it's great that that's actually documented down in, in, in evidence in terms of pathways of how we should be treating patients to, for us to be able to challenge those ritualistic practices. As I appreciate that often that these ritualistic practices are embedded by somebody more senior than a lot of you may be listening to this and it's how you challenge that and our hope is that this document gives you some of the evidence that you're able to challenge um, some of these ritualistic practices. So I'm an academic um, part-time and practicing nurse part-time. We talk about a lot about the power of the evidence. There's not much evidence in terms of the wound products, unfortunately. All the methodology is, can be questioned as quite flawed within them. And hence why it's really difficult to say that one product is better than the other in terms of wound management. However, not with compression. Compression 
has been researched and researched. It's had randomised control trials, it's had systematic reviews, it's had meta-analysis applied to it. And we know that, ev that compression does work. The evidence tells us that. And it tells us that we should be using this for any patient with any underlying venous disease and leg ulceration. And you can see the power of compression of this slide. If you look at the dates of those pictures, you can see that that patient was suffering from a large, deep venous leg ulcer. But only in a short period of time, you're able to facilitate healing. And in fact, you get total healing of that in only around two months. That is the power of compression. Venous leg ulceration though, sometimes is not so easy to manage. There has been some differenting classifications explained within the Any Qualified Provider document that's been out now for a few years. It helps us really to be able to categorise a simple venous leg ulcer over a complex venous leg ulcer. A simple venous leg ulcer is described as a wound with an area less than 100 centimetres squared that's been present for less than six week it's six months that's got a normal abpi between 0.8 and 1.3 i can't tell you though I, I can tell you though i don't see many simple venous leg ulcers anymore the wound may be simple but they certainly seem to be attached to a more complex patient the further classification of complex ulceration is much more likely to what i see in my clinic these are patients with ABPIs outside the range or patients that you cannot simply get an ABPI on because they cannot tolerate it, the patient can't lay down, you don't have the appropriate size cuff. We do see wounds that have been present for more than six months and a lot of the patients have underlying disease and comorbidities such as cardiac failure, lymphedema that really, really impact on our ability to be able to get this wound to heal quickly. However, the evidence says that we should be able to heal 70% of all venous leg ulcers, simple and complex, within 12 to 16 weeks. And that by 24 weeks, we should have healed 98% of these ulcers. Does that feel real in your terms? If you think about your caseloads that you're managing, you should only have 2% of your caseload that's had an ulcer more than 24 weeks. It certainly doesn't feel right in my world. I think a lot of my patients have ulcers for months, if not years. And actually, that's the research evidence. That's what the papers tell us we should do. But unfortunately, when you look at the reality, we're far from that. Reality in further research says that healing is only 9% of six months. You've got a mean time of healing of around five months and there's an infection rate of around 58%. That feels more real to me as a practicing clinician. So why is it so bad? Well, we know that there is a problem in terms of recognition of ulceration. Patients are treated for weeks and weeks with a wound on the lower leg. We spoke on the last webinar about challenging that, not waiting for six weeks before it's officially classed as an ulcer, trying to assess patients earlier in the pathway, especially patients that's got signs of chronic edema on their lower leg. And I also question, why is there such a stigma with the word ulceration? How many patients have you seen ask you, it's not an ulcer, is it? Why are they so frightened of that terminology of ulceration? Is there anything we can do as practitioners to help, to, um, help those patients and their fears? But even if we do have a lower leg wound that's recognised as an ulcer, we know there's problems with getting an ABPI performed. We know nobody's got time. We know there's problems with access and equipment. We know there's problems in terms of who's competent to be able to do an ABPI. Especially this seems to be worse since the shift in terms of adult community nursing services, whether it's a practice nurse responsibility or an adult community nurse's responsibility. But even if you've got an ABPI, we know that there's a problem with interpretation of them. Even if it's normal, it doesn't often associate itself with the start of compression therapy. Patients don't have a clear diagnosis. Nurses seem to be fearful of making the actual diagnosis, putting the words down, it's a venous leg ulcer. I challenge you all not to treat patients with lower leg ulceration. You're going to see Mavis, who has a venous ulcer. You're going to see Steve, who's got a mixed disease ulcer. You're going to hopefully never see Leanne with an arterial ulcer. But you need a clear diagnosis of what you're treating because it tells you what pathways they should be going down. Even if you've got a clear diagnosis, 
there is a huge problem with the underuse of compression. And an even a bigger problem in my eyes of subtherapeutic compression. Patients that started on three layer compression bandages because they won't be able to tolerate four layer. You're not even giving your patients a try. You should be putting them in for full strength compression, four layers, two layers, hosiery kits. We should be aiming to get them at 40 milligrams of mercury pressure straight away at the start of their journey not trying to step them up we should only be using those types of strategies if patients cannot comply with it but we have to give patients a trial of it and then unfortunately there is problems with inadequate compression and poor compression techniques you can see on this slide this is just disheartening and unfortunately this is what happens every day in our vascular clinics this is what patients present like that bandage is doing more harm than good so, I've said all of this and the reasons why it seems a little disheartening and I don't mean to make you disheartened. I know that there's lots of problems out there within nursing. I know that nursing is understaffed and it is underfunded. But unfortunately, we're not going to get any more money. And even if Jeremy Hunt gave us millions of pounds more, there is no more nurses out there to employ. And that situation is getting worse if you've looked at... Uh, the recruitment rates for uh, undergraduate nursing uh, for this coming year, they're undersubscribed. We are not going to get any more nurses out there. So we need to do things differently. We know that there is a problem with lack of evidence-based care and a lack of that differential diagnosis. We know that there's deviations from those known treatment protocols. There's far fewer many Dopplers being taken. Only 16% of patients had an ABPI performed. We know that there's a problem with the lack of monitoring and pathways that facilitate that expedition up that chain of line in terms of specialist referrals. We know that there's a problem with the shift of delivery of services for healthcare providers. That practice nurse versus community nurse debate. I know it's a real issue for community nurses out there at the moment, but actually I'm not that bothered. I want patients to get it right. I want patients to be treated right. I think we should stop squabbling between ourselves of whose responsibility this is and just try to get it right first time for the patient. I say that there used to be a lack of senior engagement. I think it's getting better, especially seeing though this is now on the re radar of NHS England. But there is still some huge consistency in terms of lack of continuity of care in the which clinician am I seeing today? Which dressing am I going to be used? What bandage system? should be used. So in essence, patients do deserve better and the NHS needs a solution. Well, we think that the solution is within the best practice statement. Compression therapies come a long, long way. I started being a vascular nurse back in 1990s. At that time, it was only for air compression bandaging. Nurses weren't allowed to do it. It was my consultant, Mr. Curler. He used to get down in his hands and knees to apply a fall air compression bandage. I wouldn't mind seeing that today. But things have changed dramatically. You know, only in the last 10 years, we've had great improvements in terms of two-layer bandage kits that really help and ease patients and practitioners in how you apply it, how comfortable it is, resting pressures versus working pressures. And we had that brilliant creation of those two-layer compression hosiery kits. I do think, though, that the future is rather exciting in terms of the evolution of compression. Look out in the future for the use of smart materials and smart fabrics and smart technology in compression. There's some exciting things happening or within bench research at this moment in time. But I'm not going to tell you anymore to keep you on your toes. I mentioned about the compression hosiery kits. This has got high level evidence. There was a fantastic study done by Rebecca Ashby and Co at York University. This was called the Venus 4 trial. It was a randomised control trial comparing Legal to hosiery kits to compression bandaging. It was a massive multi-centred trial with um, some degree of blinded analysis. And it showed that with the using compression hosiery kits is as effective as using traditional Farla bandage. It heals the patient as well. It's, it's slightly cheaper. But if you look at this slide, the thing that really, really attracts me is look at the difference in terms of the risk of recurrence. When using a four layer bandage system, you've got a risk of recurrence around 23%, but using a compression hosiery kit, it reduces down to 14%. Why is this? 
it took me ages to think about why this could be, but I think it's all down to brain training. If you had a venous leg ulcer and you've been suffering for two years of your life with a smelly, weepy wound that's extremely painful, and I started managing you in a compression hosiery kit, and you saw that wound once that compression started getting better and better and smaller and smaller. Once that wound had healed, would you allow me to remove that compression hosiery kit? Not on your Nelly, would you? You're already brain trained if that's what's made the difference to that underlying disease pathophysiology in terms of the venous hypertension. So therefore, is it a surprise that if you heal a patient in compression bandaging, you take the bandaging off and you give them this stocking to wear? They have no association between that stocking and that improvement of their leg ulcer. And how many of you have been to see patients who say that they're religiously wearing their compression hosiery post-healing to find it still perfectly intact in a box within one of the drawers in the patient's home? So could we use compression hosiery kits for that brain training to help to reduce our risk of recurrence? And within the best practice statement, we've tried to embed this. We're using compression bandaging, but when required, if there is limb distortion or high volumes of exudate, but we're stepping that patient down to that compression hosiery kit as soon as we possibly can to help to get that brain training and help to reduce the chances of the risk of recurrence. So I mentioned a lot about these leg ulcer kits. What are they? Well, they're fantastic, if you ask me. If I had a venous leg ulcer, I wouldn't want you to put a compression bandage on me where I couldn't put my own shoes on. That I had a big label attached to me that I had a poorly underneath my leg. That I couldn't get in the bath or the shower. That I couldn't look at my own wound and change my own dressing as I wanted. I would not comply even as a vascular nurse specialist. Give me a leg ulcer hosiery kit though, I certainly will. It's a 10 milligram, um, 10 milligram mercury pressure liner. It's a simple silky sock that goes on. And once you've got that sock on, it's dead easy to apply because it's only 10 milligrams. And once you've got that on, it provides a very low friction basis to put the secondary stocking on. That secondary stocking aims to provide 40 milligrams of mercury pressure at the ankle, the same as a traditional four layer bandage. But this is compatible with normal shoes. You can wear normal clothes. It looks like a compression hosiery. If you get similar to your other leg, you get rid of that big label attached to you that there's something wrong with you. It, you can remove this as a patient. You can self-care. In today's world of very demanding 30, 40-year-olds, I say that because I am one, at this moment in time, when you are dealing with a patient with a venous leg ulcer, 70 and 80 year old, you can say to them, you need to come to see me twice a week in my clinic. I want to see you at 10 o'clock. In the next generation of patients that's going through, in today's world of instant access and demanding of services, they will want services to develop around them. They will not be wanting to be restricted by the outpatient appointment or that appointment to see their practice nurse, district nurse. They will want something when they can solve themselves, that they can self-manage. And I think that's something that we should embrace and encourage within the NHS. So I spoke to you already about the best practice statement. Please get a copy. You can get it from the Wounds UK website. It's a fantastic document. To me, it's a real life document. It's a Bible of how we should be managing venous leg ulcers. It's about using that in bedside practice, clinic side practice. And within that, I'm so pleased to say that the algorithm that myself and Joy Tickle created has been embedded within this. What my community nurses and practice nurses were asking for were a simple algorithm to follow. They found it too complicated of being able to choose which compression bandage is better than the other. When should I use a stocking kit? When can I use a stocking kit? This algorithm is a simple piece of A4 paper that you can put on your clinic walls that tells you exactly how you should be managing a venous leg ulcer. You can deviate from this if you're a specialist in your own right, but actually what we were hearing from a lot of clinicians out there is that they have multiple areas that they need to cover. If you think of a practice nurse, they have to be good at cervical smears, immunisation, asthma control, diabetes control. How on earth are they supposed to look at the evidence base and the product range that's available in terms of compression? So this is why this algorithm came. It starts very simply by stating, have you got a patient with a wound on the lower leg? We've, we've purposely removed the word ulceration because we thought that that was a barrier both to the diagnosis and the treatment of patients. 
We know that there is 730,000 patients within the UK at this moment in time that's got an active venous leg ulcer. This is massive. This is about five times the amount of patients out there with pressure ulceration. And look at the emphasis and focus that's on pressure ulceration. This is bigger. We stated that this needs to be started with a holistic assessment of the patient. It has to include the patient's past medical history, the limb assessment, the history of the ulcer, how did it come, whereabouts is it on the leg. And what you're trying to do is to look at the signs of venous disease. Is there any evidence of visible varicosities, skin changes, skin staining, edema, any signs of venous eczema? Because there are the clues of these patients that will benefit from some degree of compression. We're wanting to encourage the amount of diagnosis that's out there. Only 54% of patients with lower leg ulceration had a specified diagnosis. We need that specified diagnosis as in terms of, is this a venous ulcer? Is it a mixed disease ulcer? Is this lymphedema? Or is this an arterial ulcer? Because that signposts you to the appropriate treatment pathways. We also need to ensure that if you're not venous disease, that you are getting expedited to the right individuals. So we want people to consider, do we need dermatology involvement? Have you considered underlying malignancy of the skin? Is this pressure? Do we need to look at pressure offloading? Is this diabetes related? Do we need the impact of the diabetic foot MDT team? Because all of that is as important because we want to improve the care of patients every patient with a lower leg ulceration, not just simply ones with venous disease. So once we've got that you've got signs and symptoms of venous disease, then it's time to look at an ABPI. Please remember the ABPI is not a diagnostic tool for venous disease. An ABPI will only exclude the presence of peripheral arterial disease. The ABPI should be used as a safety check of can this patient go into compression. The need for compression should be made one step up this algorithm at those signs and symptoms of venous disease. It is very, very upsetting to think that 84% of patients with lower leg ulceration did not get a Doppler, did not get the ankle brachial pressure index that we require to make that decision of whether compression is used. You may notice that within this algorithm, we've actually increased because some of the um, uh, guidelines did say the ABPI between 0.8 and 1.2. We know that there is increased amount of medial wall arterial calcification in the normal patient group. So we've actually made the guidelines be 0.8 to 1.3. If you're above 1.3, it doesn't mean that you are not suitable. The patient's not suitable for compression. It just means that patient requires further assessment. It needs assessment by somebody who is able to pulse palpate, who's able to listen to the Doppler waveforms. So therefore, at that point, if you cannot do that, if you haven't got the skills and the competence, you need to consider referral to the vascular centres or your local tissue viability services. If your ABPI is below 0.5, that patient is not suitable for any form of compression and needs referral to the vascular institutions. If that patient has a decreased ABPI between 0.5 and 0.8, we class them as mixed disease. They need further assessment. They need assessment in skilled hands to try to weigh up what is the predominant disease factor. You may find that a patient has an ABPI of 0.7, but if the leg has got signs of venous disease and masses amount of edema, we may well treat with compression. It's not a caveat of certainly not, but it's certainly an indication that a patient needs a specialist assessment by the tissue viability teams or the vascular specialists. So, you've done your diagnosis in terms of you've looked for signs of venous disease, you've done the ABPI and you've done, you've found that the ABPI is within those normal limits of 0.8 and 1.3. It's now time to choose the most appropriate compression for your patient. The first question we want to ask yourself is, is the exudate controlled within the dressing at this moment in time? If it's not, that patient's not going to be suitable for a comp a compression hosiery kit. By definition of the strike through that's coming through that dressing, that patient will need a bandage to be able to wick away that. You'll notice on this algorithm that this states specific products. This is my local algorithm that I'm sharing with you today because this is one I use day in, day out in my clinical practice and what's embedded within our community services. So you'll see that it actually mentions specific products. 
within the best practice statement, the algorithm is generic. It talks about elastic and inelastic bandages. But actually what my nurses were asking for is tell me exactly what product will you want us to use and where. Hence why there is terminology in this. I have no allegiance to any of the companies. Um, all my interest is, is about improving patient care. So it's asking you, is the extra date control within the dressing? If the answer to that is no, consider why. Go back and review last week's um, webinar. Um, look at why is that not the case? Are you controlling that extra date the best you possibly can? Have you selected the most appropriate dressing? Have you considered, is it an increased bacterial burden that's causing that increased management? Is there any evidence of any biofilm that could be hindering that? Looking at the reasons why the extra date is increased is vital. But if the extra date is not controlled within the dressing, you need to choose a bandage system. And within our algorithm, we ask you then to ask yourself, is there any edema on the lower leg? If you have a patient with, with um, limb distortion and edema like you see in this slide, that patient needs a short stretch system. I think the best system available for that patient is Actico compression bandaging because it provides that beautiful, strong compression that's sustained, that's going to be activated whether it's at low or high working pressures, and it will help to massage those venous systems and those lymphatic systems in combination for you to get optimum lymph volume reduction. And you can see a patient here, that you can see how beautiful that that bandage goes on. You can use the Actico system if you have moderate to severe extra date and you can use the Actico 2C system for mild, um, sorry, moderate to severe edema, not extra date, and you can use the Actico 2C system for any of the elements of mild edema. If there's no edema on the wound though, um, you can think about using an elastic system. We like the Andaflex system, but what we want to do is for you to reassess this a weekly basis to try to get rid of that problem with the extra day, to really focus on the times issue and the management of that extra day. Because as soon as you're able to get that extra day within a local dressing, we can then think about using compression hosiery kits. So once the extra day is controlled within the dressing, the next question to ask yourself is, is the amount of reducible edema? If there is still some evidence of reducible edema, you need to concentrate on that. However, if you've got a limb like this that's just showing signs of venous insufficiency with visible varicosities, hemosiderin staining, and the exudate is well controlled within the dressing, that patient is perfectly suitable for the application of an Activa Legalsa kit or an Actilymph Hosiery kit. And you can see how beautiful the fit is. Patients tend to love these things. However, if there is still some signs of limb distortion, a compression hosiery kit is no good. A compression hosiery kit won't get a fat leg thin. We need to do that and change the shape of that leg by using a compression bandage system. And to do that, we'd recommend the Actico system. Once the Actico system's on, if you're able to get that leg to a normal size and shape, like the one on the left-hand side of this patient, that patient then can be stepped down into a compression hosiery kit. Be wary, though, that that patient needs to be applied an active lymph system, not the Activa Legalsa system. And the reason for this is the active lymph system has a stronger, stiffer uh, compression um, stocking as the outer layer to not allow that edema to rebound over time. So it's the Activa Legalsa kit for non-edematous legs, and it's the active lymph system for any legs that had edema or still have mild edema. Within the algorithm though, we have put red flags throughout it. We want you to escalate up through your localised policies and procedures if there's no improvement in that wound bed in the first four weeks of treatment. We know from the evidence base that that response in the first four weeks is a vital indicator of whether this wound is going to heal or not. And we've got a further red flag in that to say that if this wound has not healed within 12 weeks, or is not showing significant signs towards healing, it needs referral to the vascular teams or the tissue viability teams. Because it's those patients that need advanced wound therapy products to be able to in increase the chances of wound healing. One of my greatest bugbears though, is the care patients get once they're healed. It rather frustrates me and annoys me that we spend so much money healing these patients' legs, but we spend very little in keeping them healed.
We need to ensure that once that patient's healed, they've got a degree of sustained compression on them. That needs to be looked at in terms of, is it, can they comply with a compression hosiery um, system? Can they have put a pot stocking on or not? If not, should we look at leg wrap systems to be able to keep that edema at bay and stop that patient from re-ulcerating? We cannot simply say the patient doesn't comply with their long-term compression cheerio. Because we know what happens to that patient. The edema starts to return, they get a bout of cellulitis, they start to have some lymphria, and guess what? The ulcer recurs. We need to step back and think about how we're managing these patients with healed ulceration. Because to me, I think it's crazy that we're not investing in HCA equivalents to do a well leg service. But I'll get off my soapbox a little. The leg ulcer algorithm impact, I just want to talk to you about the impact of this locally for us and also what I think the impact could be of this if you embedded this within your clinical services. It has increased the recognition of ulceration. It's helped to improve his diagnosis. Every patient's now got a clear diagnosis of their underlying disease pathophysiology. It helps to optimise the use of compression. It takes edema into account. It's the first algorithm for venous leg ulcers that takes edema account at the same time. It uses hosiery kits first line to help to get more patients to self-care, to help you in terms of your service delivery. If patients are in hosiery kits, can you give more tasks to the HCAs, the unregistered part of your workforce? We need to encourage more self-care because we need to reduce the burden on our services. It really helps to use them hosiery kits when we can so it's stepping from compression bandaging down to the hosiery kits as soon as we possibly can that really helps your patients to connect with that hosiery and their ulceration and ultimately that will hopefully reduce your risk of recurrence so i talked to you earlier on about the problems and if you think about our algorithm if you think about the lack of evidence-based care well it's truly embedded within it it's full of evidence it will help to improve your diagnosis it will not allow you to deviate from approved treatments. This is what you should be doing for each of the patients. It will help to improve the amount of ABPIs that you are taking. It will help in that terrible shift of services of how does a practice nurse that's got very little experience in the management of venous leg ulcers manage a leg ulcer? Easy. You follow the compression, sorry. You, you follow the algorithm. It will help to completely eliminate that inconsistency in terms of bandage choice, compression therapy choice. So if you think about all of these issues, I say patients can have better and we can provide a solution for all of this. I just want to say though that when I first listened to Kath Bowden and Julian Guest present their data regarding only 16% of patients had an ABPI, I sat in the audience and I huffed and puffed to say that that cannot be true. I could not believe that we were so bad. And I stood there and I thought, not in my world, not in my services. So I went back to my local services and I did an audit of just one district nursing practice. At that one district nursing practice, we found that on their caseload, there were 34 patients with leg ulceration. This accounted for 74 visits per week, which is around 18% of the overall activity. The amount of ulceration and duration that we've had out there, the majority of the patients had their ulcers more than six months. A large proportion of them had their ulcers actually more than three months. So, so there were lots of patients between that three to six months basis. And if you think about what we spoke about in terms of evidence that you should be able to heal 98% of patients within 24 weeks, we certainly weren't anywhere near that. And even more disheartening, when we looked at how many patients had an accurate diagnosis on their documentation, zero. How many patients had a documented ABPI who were slightly better, but only 34%. But even if you have 34% of patients have an ABPI, how many of your patients were in compression? Only 13%. That made no sense to me whatsoever. And how many of those patients, out of those patients that we've identified were showing signs of healing. Well, using that 40% wound bed reduction in the first six weeks, only 7% of the patients that we were currently seeing with leg ulceration were healing. So we embedded the algorithm. We got a nurse who championed this. She lived and breathed it and she embedded it within the whole of the services. 
Everybody started to use this algorithm. In only three months following this, 31% of patients had completely healed. Remember how long these patients had these ulceration? We've changed it around in only three months. We've reduced a third of the caseload by healing them. Three patients left the service or unfortunately died. A further seven patients were showing signs of healing. And the number of visits that were required we reduced the amount of district nurse input from 74 visits a week down to only 42 visits a week. Think about your services. If I could heal a third of your patients and reduce your visits by nearly half, what would your caseload look like? And more interestingly, when you looked at the quality indicators, 76% of patients had a diagnosis recognised within their, within their uh, uh, documentation. 76% of patients had an ABPI and 83% of patients had a compression system in place. And 56% of show patients were showing signs of healing. The benefits to the algorithm is clear to me. It will improve patients' quality of life because you will get them to heal, but it will heal your case, it will help in terms of your caseload management because it will help to improve the level of self-care. The compression is not dependent on that practitioner. You will get sustained compression of a perfect value by using hosiery kits, no matter how good you are at applying that compression bandage. It will allow for the HCAs to get more involved to help to manage your caseloads in terms of where registered practitioner is required. So just stand back and think about your caseload. Think about if you could eliminate a third of your patients who'd healed. Think about if you could get an extra third of your patients self-caring. What would that do to your nursing visits? I know it's hard out there, especially in community nursing. When was the last time that you were able to make a patient a cup of tea and a slice of toast? Maybe by using this algorithm and getting rid of some of those demands on your service by healing more patients, because ultimately that's what we want to do, by helping patients to self-care, maybe this will help to release some of your time to do that job that you came into nursing for, to provide the element of care. So I ask you all to join the Leg Ulcer Revolution, release your time to care. Thank you very much. So, I hope you enjoyed that. What we're going to do now is just show a short video that summarises some of the points that we've said today. This video has been produced by Eleanor. During this time, I'd love you to take the opportunity to ask me any questions. I'm here for you. There's no such thing as a stupid question. If you want an answer, just type it into the text box below. I'm here now for the next 15, 20 minutes just to answer your questions. So I can't wait to hear from you. Thank you so much. Um, for coming to join us today. Thanks again. They say time is a healer, and whilst that may be true for some conditions, with leg ulcers, every moment matters. Fact, a wound on the lower limb can be classed as a leg ulcer after two weeks chronicity, not six weeks. Early compression, where appropriate, will prevent ulcer development. Fact. Currently, there are 730,000 leg ulcer patients in the UK, a number that's likely to grow largely because of an ageing population. Fact, the NHS needs to save £20 billion by 2020 as part of its five-year forward view. Different thinking is needed to reach this target. Fact, self-care is not a new concept. It's a real solution that can improve the healing process. It just needs implementing. And that's where we can help. In 2016, Atkin and Tickle developed the Leg Ulcer Treatment Algorithm, which shows where self-care has to sit in order to work. Adopted by the Best Practice Statement for Holistic Management of Venous Leg Ulcers and then by NHS organisations, the algorithm shows that using solutions such as hosiery kits can drive self-care to deliver better clinical outcomes, cost savings and improved quality of life. For example, if there isn't a large amount of limb distortion or exudate, a hosiery kit is the ideal solution. But if edema and limb distortion is still present, then an inelastic wrap system is perfect for supporting healing. What makes these products stand out? Activa and Actilymph hosiery kits deliver a measured level of compression, providing peace of mind when applying. Plus, it enables the little things that matter so much, like wearing shoes. For those with edema and limb distortion, Ready Wrap is comfortable to wear 
adjustable and colour-coded for easier application. Either way, both products used correctly can give patients their independence back, making them feel more human. And that matters. If your patient isn't self-caring yet, not a problem. This can be set as a future goal for patients and their carers. These solutions can be used to prepare your patient for being more able to self-care in the future. So isn't it time we encourage self-care? Self-care empowers patients to say, I can help myself. After all, with Legolsa treatment, every moment matters.